we've been following Paul's missionary journeys, something we've all heard about since we were in Sunday school. And this is where he's taking the good news to the many foreign nations of the Roman Empire, starting with the many Jewish communities. And the good news is that the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for has come. He invariably begins by showing up in a city and going to the local synagogue to speak. But this good news was not so good to many diaspora Jews because it bore little resemblance to the teachings of their Jewish religious leadership concerning the nature and the purpose of a Messiah. What was most difficult to swallow, perhaps, was the deity of Yeshua. Not surprisingly, many Gentile god fears who attended some of these synagogues, well, they were more open to the gospel of Yeshua because they weren't as indoctrinated to the Jewish traditions about the expected nature of the Messiah as were the Jews. Now, the traditional perspective was that the Messiah would be, as much, would be much as King David was, even perhaps a reincarnation of sorts of King David himself. This Messiah would be a warrior leader, and he would propel the Jews to a successful rebellion against Rome, free the Jewish nation from its occupiers, install the Jewish Messiah as the new Davidic king of a new and expanded Israelite kingdom and essentially replace the Roman Empire as the world power. This was an era when the synagogue, not the temple, was the source of Jewish religious instruction. And the oversight for proper observance and behavior was performed by the synagogue leaders. And they took their cue from the Pharisees. The temple was considered by many ordinary Jews to be at best of questionable authority. And as with the essence, at worst, corrupt and illegitimate. So priests were simply there. And they were tolerated because of the Torah-required rituals and ceremonial functions that they, and only they, could perform on behalf of the people. If the ordinary Jews refused to cooperate with the priests and recognize their authority, then they found themselves unable to comply with the laws of Moses, regardless of how much they might have looked down upon this priesthood with contempt. Nevertheless, the Jews of Judea and the Galilee had a close connection with the temple, even though they also gave their allegiance to the various synagogues. But the Jews of the diaspora, they had much less to do with the temple, since only the most able had the wherewithal or even the motivation to make the long, expensive, sometimes risky trip to Jerusalem from whatever foreign soil they lived upon in order to, to be obedient to the Torah, to participate in the, the various biblical festivals. Certainly, it was completely impractical for them to go to the temple to offer sacrifices to atone for their sins as the occasions arose. Thus, a veritable stream of itinerant prophets and teachers went out from Jerusalem. And they made their way to the many synagogues of the diaspora where they were generally well received and they were viewed as representatives coming from home base. Paul and his disciples were seen as among those many itinerant teachers. And so getting an audience was not difficult. Well, when we left off last time, Paul was about to leave Corinth after a great deal of trouble had arisen due to the message of salvation as he intended to make his way back to the Holy Land. Now, 
he would take a ship to get there. But before he left, at the seaport of Kinshrea, he had his hair cut to fulfill the ritual requirements of a vow that he had made. Now, we know nothing about the nature or the purpose of this vow or even when he first made it. Acts 18.18 18 reports on this matter with little comment as though Luke's readers ought to fully understand the ins and outs of Paul having his hair cut as part of a vow fulfillment. Now, I, I certainly wish Luke had told us more because through the centuries, Gentile Christians have accepted some very dubious teachings of the early church fathers about what Paul did and why he did it. And while not universal, the consensus is to apologize for what Paul did and to try to sweep it under the carpet is a little bit embarrassing. Let me elaborate on that by quoting from a letter written by the early church father, Jerome, from the mid-fourth century A.D. He says this, Granted that there Paul did what he did not wish to do through the compelled fear of the Jews. Why did he let his hair grow in consequence of a vow and afterward cut it at Kentrea in obedience to the law? Because the Nazarites who vowed themselves to God were accustomed to do this according to the commands of Moses. So Jerome says, Paul didn't do this by his own free will. He didn't want to do it. He had it forced on him out of fear of the Jews. He only did it to satisfy a Jewish custom so that he wouldn't find himself in a bad way with the local Jewish population. Later on, the church father, Venerable Beatty, had a different sort of rationalization for why Paul performed this vow ritual. In his commentary on the book of Acts, Beatty wrote, Paul did these things, performed that vow ritual of haircutting, not indeed because he'd forgotten what he along with all the other apostles had settled in Jerusalem concerning the abolition of the law, but so that those among the Jews who had come to believe might not be scandalized. So he played the part of a Jew himself in order to win over the Jews. Did you just hear that? Now, I could read this in almost any church in the world and get affirming nods and perhaps even applause. But my hope is you realize how anti-Semitic, anti-Scripture, and just plain erroneous such a thought process is. Beatty claims that Paul indeed do this hair-cutting Vow ritual, even though he knew that the law had been abolished, supposedly, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. But even more, Beatty suggests that Paul pretended to still be a Jew. He merely played a role. And this was in order to win the approval of Jews so that they would hear the gospel from him. That is, Beatty claims, as did most of the church by this time, by the way, that James and the Jerusalem Council had abolished the law of Moses for believers, Jew or Gentile, even though no such statement or implication exists in Scripture. But even more, we see that the church view had very early on hardened, such that to be a believer in Christ meant that if one was born a Jew, one had to convert to a Gentile and fully abandon his or her former Jewish identity. Thus, the church fathers felt that somewhere along the way, Paul had actually renounced his Jewish heritage and become a Gentile. The hair-cutting ritual was merely a ruse. This allowed him to continue playing a role pretending to still be Jewish. And, what the, and the reason Paul did that was in order to deceive his fellow Jews 
for their own benefit, so that they would listen to what he had to say about salvation and Yeshua, then they would give up their Jewishness and become Christians. Now, I hope you're as appalled at this as I am. But friends, this well-documented mindset of many of the influential early church fathers, all Gentiles, of course, is the source of what a majority of Christians still believe to this day. And these thoughts are enshrined in some of the most foundational doctrines of Christianity. It is the classic method of Bible interpretation to begin with a doctrine decided long ago by a Gentile church council and then work backwards to twist and turn scripture passages to make them fit the doctrine. So here in Acts 18.18, 18, the recorded beliefs of these two highly church fathers, uh, highly respected church fathers, they imply that Paul isn't even really a Jew anymore. However, he wants the local Jews to think he still is. So he goes through with this ceremonial haircutting as part of a vow, but he's not at all sincere about it. It's merely part of a bait and switch scheme so that the local Jews might find him trustworthy as one of them. And when their guard is down, he can pounce on them with the gospel of Christ. Unbelievable. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Well, let's reread a short section of Acts 18 to begin our lesson today. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1386. We are going to start reading with verse 19. So we're going to start reading at Acts 18, verse 19. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue, and he held dialogue with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay with them longer, he declined. However, in his farewell, he said, God willing, I will come back to you. Then he set sail from Ephesus. After landing at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and he greeted the Messianic community. Then he came down to Antioch, spent some time there, and afterwards he set out and passed systematically through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the Talmudim, that's the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jewish man named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Now, he was an eloquent speaker with a thorough knowledge of the Tanakh. This man had been informed about the way of the Lord, and with great spiritual fervor, he spoke and taught accurately the facts about Yeshua. But he knew only the immersion of Yochanan, the immersion or the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Achilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God in fuller detail. What? When he made plans to cross over to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him, and they wrote the disciples there to welcome him. And on arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had come to trust. For he powerfully and conclusively refuted the unbelieving Jews in public, demonstrating by the Tanakh that Yeshua is the Messiah. So Paul arrived in Ephesus, and he stayed there briefly. The only reason he was even in Ephesus is because that was the route of the ship that he was on. First, it would stop at Ephesus, and then it would continue on to Caesarea Maritima, which is the major port city for the Holy Land and Paul's destination. Now, his first agenda item upon arrival was to go to Jerusalem and report to the believing community there since that was the headquarters of the way. Now, a couple of things. First, 
While the complete Jewish Bible inserts the word Jerusalem, it's not actually there. The text merely says that first Paul went up to greet the community. Most Bibles, communities, by the way, is translated as church. And then after he went up, we're told he went down to Antioch. See, these terms, went up and went down, are merely common Jewish expressions. Went up or, or to go up always referred to going to Jerusalem. You didn't have to insert the word Jerusalem. Thus, in contrast to the up of Jerusalem, anywhere else one might go is down. It's really an expression of veneration and status of the place because Jerusalem was by no means the highest geographical elevation even in the Holy Land. But it was the highest place from a status perspective and from a religious perspective. Thus, every other place in the world, even Mount Everest, would be considered as being down from Jerusalem. Second, in verse 22, where we usually find the word church in English Bibles, but in the complete Jewish Bible, instead we find Messianic community, the Greek word is ecclesia. Now, ecclesia is a kind of common, generic Greek word that means assembly or community. Any kind of an assembly or community. It carries no religious connotation with it. However, most modern Bibles substitute the word church for ecclesia in order to give us the mental picture of going to a place with stained glass, a steeple, pews, and a group of Gentile Christians meeting there to praise Jesus. And while indeed it was believers in Yeshua that Paul went to see, they were all Jews. And they all continued to practice their Jewish ways. They continued to meet in their synagogues. They followed the standard Jewish liturgy. There was no stained glass, no steeples, and no pews. Now, Antioch was where the synagogue that had been sponsoring his missionary trips was located. We're told that Paul visited there for some time, and then he departed to again visit a number of the believers that he had established in the region of Phrygia. Well, verse 24 changes the subject. And now we're introduced to a believer named Apollos. He had come to Ephesus to teach. Now, Ephesus at this time was similar to London. It was a commercial and banking center. It was self-governing and was probably the third largest city in the Roman Empire after only Rome and Alexandria, Egypt. So if one wanted an opportunity to connect with a great number of Jews and or Gentiles in a short time, Ephesus was the place to go. Now I pointed out in earlier lessons that while Paul was a special emissary personally commissioned by the risen Yeshua to take the good news to both the Jews and Gentiles, he wasn't the only believer that was doing this. Paul was the foremost Jewish apostle, but he wasn't in charge of all the efforts to evangelize. Many others took it upon themselves, usually no doubt at the direction of the Holy Spirit, to tell people in foreign lands about the ways of the God of Israel. But Apollos, you see, was not from Jerusalem. He was a diaspora Jew. He lived in the largest Jewish center outside of the Holy Land at that time, Alexandria, Egypt. Now history knows of Alexandria, who was named for Alexander the Great, as a cosmopolitan city of diverse cultures. One of its most famous institutions was its unrivaled library. The city sat at the crossroads of commerce, so it was thriving, it was a wealthy place, and it attracted people from all over the empire. Many famous Jews 
lived in Alexandria, including the intellectual Philo. A treasure chest of Jewish thought was created and stored in Alexandria. The education system was unsurpassed. So it's not surprising that someone of Apollo's capabilities would come from there. However, the most popular brand of Judaism practiced in Alexandria was quite progressive. And it was in line with the Hellenism that Rome wanted as the sort of universal culture of their empire. Thus, Jewish philosophy, more than Torah scholarship, was the result. Nevertheless, some of the, the best, the brightest Jewish minds flocked there to argue their points of view with other Jewish intellectuals. But it was also in Alexandria that the first Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible was created three centuries earlier. This is the Bible that we know today as the Septuagint. And it is what most Jews of that era used for their Bible. Now, Apollos is, not surprisingly, described as an eloquent speaker who was very studied in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible. What we learn about what Apollos knew and believed and taught can be a little bit confusing. On the one hand, we're told that he is a great Bible scholar, that he had been informed about the way of the Lord, and that he accurately taught facts about Yeshua. But then we're thrown a curveball. In verse 25, it says that even so, he only knew about the immersion of Yochanan, John the Baptist. And Apollos, you see, was such a good speaker that he was invited to speak in synagogues and Paul's friends, Aquila and Priscilla, who were still in Ephesus, went to hear him speak and teach. <laughs> but they quickly realized uh, there was much Paulo didn't know about Christ. So they undertook to teach him. Now, the implication is that the brilliant Apollos was sufficiently humble that he welcomed Aquila and Priscilla's knowledge about Yeshua. Now, there's a lot to talk about here. At this time in history, around 52 AD, there were many strands of Messianic Judaism in existence. The one that we know most about was the one led by James and Peter in Jerusalem, but there were several more. Not all of those strands looked to James and Peter as their religious authorities. Now, some believers, no doubt including Apollos, were so intelligent and educated that they didn't feel the need to have a mentor or to be given official permission to go and teach about Yeshua and the gospel. So they didn't all believe the same things and therefore they didn't all teach the same doctrines. They studied on their own and they sought to enlighten others on their own. So it's nearly impossible for us to know with any certainty exactly what it is that Apollos was teaching about Yeshua. What is startling, however, is that when asked about baptism, he said he only knows about John's baptism and he knows nothing about being immersed into Yeshua. Well, what does John's baptism mean? Actually, we've dealt with this before, but let's review it. John the Baptist preached repentance of sins. Repentance of sins. And so when he baptized, it was for repentance of sins. This is an entirely different issue than salvation in Christ. John did not baptize for salvation in Christ. And thus, one did not receive the Holy Spirit in John's baptism. 
course, John was baptizing before Pentecost event happened, after Yeshua's death and written resurrection. However, what John taught was that before one could be saved, one first had to repent of sins. Thus, John's was a sort of preliminary baptism to Christ's. Okay, then what is baptism in Christ? The Bible tells us that this immersion is a complete rebirth from a spiritual perspective. So the sequence is repentance first, rebirth second. Apparently, Apollos knew a great deal about Yeshua. He was well steeped in information about Yeshua, which would have come mainly from word of mouth. And he could communicate these things. And that while he had repented for his sins, he was part of John's baptism, he had not accepted Yeshua in the way we typically think of it. And apparently did not know enough to realize that this baptism in Christ was a vital step. Therefore, he could not have received the Holy Spirit. This shows us something important. A non-believer can be, can be quite an effective Bible teacher. That surprise you? I can vouch for this. Because many modern Bible commentators that I have read, very good ones, not only aren't Christians, they don't even believe in God. Before you pick up a commentary, do a little research on the author. Oftentimes it will shock you. This goes for both Jewish and Gentile Bible scholars. Usually they are highly educated historians and or brilliant language scholars. But for them, the Bible is merely humanly created literature. And they have become expert on the Bible as a career path, but not as a source of truth or as a divine holy book. Apollos, on the other hand, well, he was a spiritual man. He believed in the God of Israel. He believed in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, as truth. And he also seemed to believe some things about Yeshua that's not at all clear to us. Apparently, Achilla and Priscilla tutored Apollos in the beliefs and doctrines of the way. That's the Jerusalem-based strand of Messianic Judaism. Now, by all accounts, he seems to have accepted it. Now, remember, there was no such thing as a New Testament for Apollos to study. There wouldn't be a New Testament for another 150 years. In time, but not yet, some of Paul's letters would start to be shared among believers. And a couple of the gospel accounts would also start to circulate informally. But a number of other teaching letters and gospels written by other authors than the ones that are in our Bibles also gained traction. So whatever Apollos had learned and would, and would learn about Yeshua would have come from listening to others. What those others, who those others were, before Aquila and Priscilla taught him, we don't know. Now, I don't want to wax too philosophical. However, there are so many millions of Christians who have some facts and knowledge about Jesus. But what is it that they think they know about him? What is it that they actually believe about him? What is it that they felt was happening to them when they were immersed? If ever they were immersed. And if they were immersed, immersed into what? 
I mean, are we really saved in God's eyes if the Jesus Christ that we believe in is nothing like the one in the Bible? Or that what he actually taught that's recorded in the New Testament are not the doctrines that we've been told are what he commands for, of us and they're not the values that we're to live by. I mean, I wish I had answers for you. But there can be no better example of this conundrum than Apollos. We are left to ponder whether this fine man was truly saved before he met Aquila and Priscilla? Or was it only afterward when vital blanks of his faith in God were filled in? See, knowledge is indeed the key. But it has to be correct knowledge. And trust in Yeshua is the door. But it has to be the real Yeshua. Not the one of our personal imaginings or one that we prefer. Clearly, Apollos was a motivated evangelist and a very gifted one as well. So after some undisclosed amount of time, he traveled to Achaia to speak and to teach. He apparently had gained enough knowledge and sufficiently agreed with the doctrines of the way that letters of recommendation were sent on his behalf to believers in Achaia that they would welcome him. And when he arrived, he fearlessly debated the unbelieving Jews in public and he used the Holy Scriptures, this as opposed to reasoning with them, to demonstrate the truth of what he was teaching. And he was teaching that Yeshua of Nazareth is indeed the Messiah that the Tanakh spoke about. Let's move on to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, page 1387, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Shaul completed his travels through the inland country, and he arrived at Ephesus, where he found a few disciples. And he asked them, did you receive the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, when you came to trust? No, they said to him. We've never even heard that there's such a thing as a Holy Spirit. In that case, he said, into what were you immersed? The immersion of Yochanan, John, they answered. And Paul said, well, Yochanan practiced an immersion in connection with turning from sin to God, but he told the people to put their trust in the one who would come after him, that is, in Yeshua. And on hearing this, they were immersed into the name of the Lord Yeshua. And when Shaul placed his hands on them, the Ruach HaKodesh came upon them so that they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And all, there were about 12 of these men. Well, Shaul went into the synagogue, and for three months he spoke out boldly, engaging in dialogue, trying to persuade people about the kingdom of God. But some began hardening themselves and refusing to listen. And when these started defaming the way before the whole synagogue, Shaul withdrew, and he took the, the, uh, the Talmudim, the disciples, with him, and he commenced holding daily dialogues in Tyrannius's yeshiva. This went on for two years. So that everyone, both Jews and Greeks, living in the province of Asia, heard the message about the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. For instance, handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were brought to sick, to sick people. And they would recover from their ailments. The evil spirits would leave them. Then some of the Jewish exorcists who traveled from place to place tried to make use of the name of the Lord Yeshua in connection with people who had evil spirits. And they would say, I exercise you in the name of Yeshua that Saul's proclaiming. And one time, seven sons of a Jewish Kohen, uh, Gadol, high priest named Skeva, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered them. And it said, well, Yeshua, I know. Shaul I recognize, but you? Who are you? And then the man with the evil spirit fell upon them, overpowered them, and gave them such a beating that they ran from the house naked and bleeding. 
When all this became known to the residents of Ephesus, fear fell on all of them, Jews and Greeks alike, and the name of the Lord Yeshua came to be held in high regard. Many of those who had earlier made professions of faith now came and publicly admitted their evil deeds, and a considerable number of those who had engaged in occult practices threw their scrolls in a pile and burned them in public. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, it came to 50,000 drachmas. Thus, the message about the Lord continued in a powerful way to grow and influence. Sometime later, Shaul decided by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and then go on to Jerusalem. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome. So he dispatched two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia. But he himself remained in the province of Asia for a while. It was at this time that a major furor arose concerning the way. There was a silversmith named Demetrius who manufactured from silver objects connected with the worship of the god Artemis. And he provided no small amount of work for the craftsmen. Well, he called a meeting of them and of those engaged in similar trades and said, Men, you understand that this line of business provides us our living. And you can see and hear for yourselves that not only here in Ephesus, but in, in practically the whole province of Asia, this, this Paul has convinced and turned away a considerable crowd by saying that man-made gods aren't gods at all. Now, the danger is that not only that the reputation of our trade will suffer, but the temple of the great goddess Artemis will come to be taken lightly. I mean, it could end up with the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and indeed throughout the whole world being ignominiously brought down from her divine majesty. Well, hearing this, they were filled with rage and they began bellowing, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. As one man, the mob rushed into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Arist uh, uh, Aristarchus, Shaul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Shaul himself wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of his, sent a message begging him not to risk entering the theater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, others shouting something else because the assembly was in complete confusion and the great majority didn't even know why they were there. Some of the crowd explained the situation to Alexander whom the Jews had pushed to the front. So Alexander motioned for silence, hoping to make a defense speech to the people. But as soon as they recognized that he was a Jew, they began bellowing in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And they kept it up for two hours. At last, the city clerk was able to quiet the crowd. Men of Ephesus, he said, is there anyone who doesn't know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone which fell from the sky? Since this is beyond dispute, you had better calm down and not do anything rash, for you have brought these men here who have neither robbed the temple nor insulted your goddess. So if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. The judges are there. Let them bring charges and counter charges. But, there is, but if there's something more you want, it's going to have to be settled in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being accused of rioting on account of what has happened today. There is no justification for it. And if we're asked... We'll be unable to give any reasonable explanation for this disorderly gathering. And with these words, he dismissed the assembly. <clears throat> In verse 1 of chapter 19, we learn that Apollos was in Corinth at the same time Paul had arrived in Ephesus. Now, this was Paul's second time in Ephesus. Seems that he goes to some believers there, and he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit when they came to belief. No, they said. In fact, they had never even heard of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 
So what we're learning is that apparently through one believer or another, many Jews and Gentiles had learned about Yeshua. They would believed what they heard. And just like Apollos, they'd even been baptized. But they had been baptized into John's baptism. A baptism of repentance of sins. And indeed, Paul, Paul agrees with that. But he says there has to be another baptism as well. One of the issues of New Testament times, this is going to help you, so give me your attention on this. One of the issues of New Testament times was that immersion had become a kind of social norm. And it tended to identify a person with a particular teacher or a philosopher or, or even a political party or rather a religious party. Thus we'll hear of Paul speak of people being baptized into his name. Just as we hear the same of John the Baptist, of course of Yeshua. In fact, being baptized into the teachings or ways of someone uh, was common. And it, it didn't carry the specific religious meaning that we think of today. Joseph Shulam calls what was going on a personality cult. It's not unlike young people who will follow certain rock stars wherever they go because they're so enthralled with them. And then it was rather usual that after being immersed into a certain teacher or philosopher, another teacher would eventually come along that tickled this, person ears, this person's ears and they'd change allegiance by being immersed, literally and figuratively, into this latest teacher's ways. So the practice of immersion had become somewhat tainted in its reason and purpose. Thus we see one reason why Paul would even think to ask into what, or more in line with the times, into who these professed believers in Ephesus, they'd been immersed. And these disciples told him it was into John. It was into the immersion of John. But a second reason for his inquiry is that no doubt Paul sensed that these believers had but the most vague understanding of their faith in Yeshua. Paul never seems to question whether they rightly accepted that from a historical and a factual basis, Yeshua was the Messiah. But to Paul, there was also no sign that any of these disciples were bearing the evidence of having received the Spirit. No doubt Paul had encountered this before. He knew the symptoms as well as what questions to ask and then how to respond to it. Now, we must be honest in noting that after immersing these disciples, who seemed to put up no protest, and he immersed them into the immersion of Yeshua, Paul then laid his hands on them, and it's upon laying on of his hands that they received the Holy Spirit, the text says. It has been a long-running debate within various denominations as to whether it was the immersion or the laying on of hands that the Holy Spirit came upon these men even more they began speaking in tongues. And for me, it's the speaking in tongues and not the reception of the Holy Spirit that we need to be looking at. Speaking in tongues is something that seems to have occurred whenever one of the apostles was directly involved in someone coming to faith. In fact, we saw this in the case of Cornelius and Peter, for instance. Yet Paul clearly implies that it is being immersed into the name of Yeshua that brings in the Holy Spirit. Now, immersion and laying on hands are two different things done for different purposes. So it's hard to know what to make of this other than it may be a special privilege that the Lord blessed these apostles with 
to cause these disciples present to speak in tongues. After all, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, Peter was present. And there was no immersion at all. Even so, the disciples began speaking in tongues. So I think it's wrong to contrive a, a, a rigid doctrinal formula or demand a certain sequence based on what we've read to this point about the coming of the Holy Spirit, immersion, laying on of hands, speaking in tongues. But one thing is clear. Water immersion in the name of Yeshua is a New Testament commandment for believers. It's not an option. And receiving the Holy Spirit is the sign of our acceptance into the kingdom. Yet we have seen instances where the Holy Spirit came before immersion. Other instances where he came after immersion. We've seen instances of the new believers speaking in tongues. Other times, it doesn't happen. Or at least it's not mentioned. Now Paul previously had made a short visit to the synagogue of Ephesus when he was on his way from Corinth to the Holy Land and he promised them that if the Holy Spirit led him back, he would come and he'd teach them more. Having completed his business back home, he made the 1,500 mile overland journey back to Ephesus to fulfill his promise. Paul taught there for three months, apparently without interference. But as has always happened, in time, those who just couldn't bring themselves to accept Paul's teaching on Yeshua and salvation turned on him. And the trouble began. Those in the Ephesus synagogue who had hardened their hearts and become firm in their opposition to the gospel began, of course, to speak not only against Paul, but also against the way. This time, in response, Paul did an interesting thing. He took those disciples who had come to believe and he departed with them in tow from the synagogue. And he began preaching and teaching in an entirely new venue, the Hall of Tyrannus, or as it says in the complete Jewish Bible, in Tyrannus' yeshiva. Now what we see here is what today we might call a church split. Yet when we see this from God's perspective, this goes back to one of the first God principles I ever taught you. The principle of division, election, and separation. See, sometimes the Lord determines to divide us into groups, to elect the group that he chooses to follow him for a certain divine purpose, and separates them, us, from everyone else. I mean, I can tell you from experience that as difficult and gut-wrenching as it is, sometimes there's no choice but to leave a congregation that you had been part of and go elsewhere. Perhaps it happens because you've learned too much to continue identifying yourself with a group that you know is stubbornly wrong-minded and is no longer in harmony with Yeshua. Other times, it isn't so much about right and wrong as it is about following the Lord's plan for your life. Sadly, it can also be over the most petty or selfish things. And the split and separation reflects nothing but human failure. Yet when it's done for the right reasons and seems to be God-directed, what are we to do? Twice now, we have seen Paul do this. The first time he acrimoniously parted company with his longtime traveling companion, Barnabas. Remember, this was over his nephew, John Mark. Now he not only leaves this synagogue on bad terms, but he takes with him those who adhere to what Paul's teaching. I mean, it's one thing to go away, but the anger only increases when you take people with you. Let's part today with this thought. What Paul did in leaving the synagogue and taking disciples with him was radical, 
and generally was considered a serious offense against halakha, against Jewish law. No doubt the word got around the Jewish communities of the diaspora. And so from here forward, we won't find Paul going to many more synagogues. Some say he never again preached in synagogues, but I find that highly improbable. This incident, put this back in your memory banks, this incident is going to have a lot to do with what we're going to read in Acts 21 about Paul going to Jerusalem, consulting with James about one of the main issues being that Paul was being slandered among some of the Jewish communities with the accusation he was speaking against the law. So James was going to give Paul a public, have, have, uh, have Paul give a public demonstration of his continuing allegiance to the law of Moses. We'll read about that when we get to chapter 21. We'll continue with Acts chapter 19 next time.